Vice-Chancellor, fellow council members, staff of the university, graduates, graduates, ladies and gentlemen. Today's ceremony for the conferring of awards is an important and happy occasion in the university year. To all of you, I extend a warm welcome. To diplomats, graduates and graduates, I offer congratulations and best wishes. The university's mission commits it to achieving international excellence in education and research. It is also committed to work through partnerships for regional, national and global enrichment. The university's record of achievement, particularly in research, is outstanding. In 1997, the research funding base increased by 18% to a total of $24 million, ranking the university ninth out of 36 public universities in Australia. An increase of over $3 million for medical research projects in 1998 put the university seventh in that pecking order. In 1997, the university also launched two new special research centres in the Faculty of Engineering and an Indigenous Higher Education Centre, Umaliko, in the Faculty of Arts and Social Science. I think you'll agree this is an exceptional performance which reflects the quality of the research being conducted by the university staff. More generally, these achievements are also significant because there is a synergistic relationship between teaching and research. Good research and research outcomes feed into the content and currency of teaching. Graduates of the University of Newcastle can therefore be confident that the curriculum they have studied reflects cutting edge technologies. Education today is about the acquisition of lifelong learning skills, so I suppose you could say today is a beginning, not an end for you. I believe that the awards to be conferred upon our diplomats, graduates and graduates today will qualify them to make significant contributions in the local, national and in the case of some, the international community. I also take this opportunity to remind those receiving their test aimers that as diplomats and graduates of the university you automatically become members of convocation. You thus join more than 45,000 other graduates and have an opportunity through elected representatives to become involved in the governance of your university. By the authority conferred upon me by the council, I will now formally confer academic awards. Will all candidates for admission to degrees and other awards please stand. In the name of the council and by my authority as chancellor, I confer the awards specified in the program on all those graduates, graduates and diplomats who are present today and in absentia on those unable to be present. Would you like to sit? I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts, Tara Louise Adam. Peter Beckwith. Michelle Bowie. Lorraine Brown. Scott Brown. Claire Cameron. Benedict Wing Long Chan. <laughs> Patricia Chaplin. <laughs> Paul Chapman. <laughs> Jesse Davis. Ponrial Deng Nai. (Applause) 
Norma Fairhurst. <laughs> Salisi Fayanango Nufu. <laughs> Jennifer Gregory. Tamara Hoyja Russell. Pauline Jones. Lynn Kennedy. Catherine Keogh. David Killen. <laughs> Edith Kavafi. <laughs> Carrie Lamb. <laughs> Tanya Madison. Martin McRae, <laughs> Catherine McGrath, <laughs> Fiona McLaughlin, <laughs> James McKeon. Robert Nicholson. <laughs> Paul Nowland. <laughs> Mary O'Connor. <laughs> Trevor Pasco. Elizabeth Pitham. <laughs> Keita Quinn. <laughs> Wendy Ratcliffe. <laughs> Shauna Spence. Matthew Stevenson. Claire Stuckey. Anne Whiteman. Fleck Lin Yo. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate who has studied for two degrees simultaneously. I present a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Arts and the degree of Bachelor of Speech Pathology with first class honours, Gillian McElwain. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts with honours, Class II, Division I. Serena Chorchi. <laughs> Kylie Ebert. <laughs> Lorraine Michelle Hipworth. Michelle Kugler. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Arts with Honours uh, Class 1, Louise Slaven. <laughs> 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 
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Arts Communication Studies. Leonie Bran. <laughs> Melissa Kilkenny. Melissa Matheson. <laughs> Jennifer Nicholson. <laughs> Tanya Notley. <laughs> Fiona Wally. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Arts Psychology with Honours Class 2 Division 1, Alison Gosper. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Social Science, John Hubbock. Simon Mannion. Sarah McNeish. Anne Minard. Linda Neal. Cheryl Punch. <laughs> Renee Taylor. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Social Science, Recreation and Tourism. Matlab Morton. Susanna Vajeskia. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Speech uh, uh, Pathology, Michelle Rabbit. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Social Science, Jane Cadman. <laughs> Penelope Parker. <laughs> Jerry Rea Pulley. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Social Work, Anthony Vasalio. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Arts and Social Science. I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Education to present a diplomat and graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you a candidate who has satisfied the requirements for the award of the Diploma in Teaching in the Specialisation of Technical and Further Education, Mary Callaghan. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Education, Heidi Cox. <laughs> Melissa Fraser. <laughs> Peter Groves.
Suzanne Michael. Claire Mitchell. Sharon Moss. Alison Turner. Chancellor, I present to you a candidate who has satisfied the requirements for the award of Graduate Certificate in Educational Studies, Colleen Timoshenko. Chancellor, I present to you candidates who have satisfied the requirements for the award of the Diploma in Education in the Specialisation of Secondary Education, John Keneally. Andrew Marley. Anne McEwen. <laughs> Jeffrey Spore. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a candidate who has satisfied the requirements for the award of the Diploma in Education in the Specialisation of Secondary Education with merit, Michelle Ryan. <clears throat> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Educational Studies, Beth Balti. <clears throat> Christopher Brown. Jennifer Crichton. Jenny Fogarty. Sharon Marie Hitchcock. Khalil Kawa. Peter Nicolatatis. Sheena O'Doherty. Adrian Rooney. Daniel Wyborn. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Leadership and Management in Education, Louise McLaughlin. Louise Reeves. <laughs> Stephen Smith. <laughs> Anne Spencer. Gina Whelan. <laughs> Leonie Young. <laughs> 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 
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Special Education, Diane Crawford. Catherine Crellon. Heather Gill. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of a diplomat and graduates from the Faculty of Education. I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Computer Science, Robert Fitzgerald. Robert Gregory. Daniel Hall. <laughs> Rowan Heyer. <laughs> Gregory Luckman. <laughs> Daniel Nowak. Brian Reich. <laughs> Catherine Seskus. <laughs> Thiobalan Thirachelvin. <laughs> Chancellor. I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Chemical Engineering with honours Class II, Division II, Carolyn Rame. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate who has studied for two degrees simultaneously. I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Engineering in Chemical Engineering with honours class one. Kelly Morris. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Civil Engineering, Francesco Messina. <laughs> Scott O'Connor. David Powell. Gregory Williams. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Engineering, Peter Lucis. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Computer Engineering, Honours Class II, Division I, Dean Collins. <laughs> Wang Jern Hung. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Electrical Engineering, Sydney Lazen. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Environmental Engineering, Catherine Ling.
Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Industrial Engineering with Honours Class II, Division II, Prasanna Jinadasa. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering, Natasha Ivelji. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Engineering. I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Law to present a graduate from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Laws, Henry Long. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation from the Faculty of Law. <laughs> I now call on the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of the Bachelor of Applied Science, Consumer Science. Carl Dunn. <laughs> Jody Michelle Fogarty. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Health Science, Occupational Therapy. Rebecca Bell. <laughs> Nicole Rutherford. <laughs> Chancellor, I present you a graduate of the degree of Bachelor of Health Science, Occupational Therapy, with honors, class one, Fiona Cooch. Chancellor, I present you a graduate of the degree of Master of Health Sciences in the Specialization of Women's Health, Lisa Cray. <laughs> Chancellor, I present you a graduate of the degree of Master of Medical Science in the Specialization of Pharmacoepidemiology, Bronwyn Underwood. Chancellor, I present you a graduate of the degree of Master of Medical Science, Health Promotion, Alana Heil. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. And I call on the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Mathematics to present graduates from that faculty. Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Environmental Science, Andrew Benson. Ben Chandler. David Bryan Dury. <laughs> Ryan Gifford. <laughs> Mark Girard. <laughs> Michael Griffith.
Naomi Martin. James Moore. Sandra Otto. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Mathematics, Tim Ham. <laughs> Leah Ratliff. Joanne Sanders. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science, Michelle Barrett. <laughs> Michael Britt. Karen Carthew, <laughs> Matthew Crotty, <laughs> Naomi Downey, <laughs> Ian Duddy. Rochelle Fittler, Jade Ho, Gaylene Kennedy, Stephen Lee. Adele Mackey, John McLaughlin, Cherry McElroy, Linda Minch. <coughs> Glennis Murray, Kirk Newport, Nicholas Nolan, Simone Ransley. Louis Rodriguez, <laughs> Cecilia Walkham, <laughs> Kathy Warmold, <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Bachelor of Science with honours class one, Michael Gladys. <laughs> Timothy Howard. <laughs> Paul Manusui. Chancellor, I present you a graduate of the degree of Master of Applied Psychology, Lynn Lawson. <laughs> Chancellor, I present you a graduate of the degree of Master of Environmental Studies, Martin Hicks. <laughs> Ch 
Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Scientific Studies, Joseph Bunin. Hesham Hamey. <laughs> Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of graduates from the Faculty of Science and Mathematics. I call on the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research to present research higher degree candidates. Chancellor, <clears throat> I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Computer Science. I present to you Slaman, Bachelor of Education of the University of Jemba. <clears throat> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Engineering. I present to you Richard Close, Bachelor of Engineering of this university. Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Laws. I present to you Michael Eburn, Bachelor of Commerce and Bachelor of Laws of the University of New South Wales and Bachelor of Arts Honours of the University of New England. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a, a graduate of the degree of Master of Medical Science, Clinical Epidemiology. I present to you Leslie Gillespie, Bachelor of Science of the University of Edinburgh. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Medical Science, Medical Social Science. I present to you Chajri Kuchaiset, Bach Bachelor of Science of uh, Konkan University and Master of Science of Mahidol University. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you graduates of the degree of Master of Psychology Clinical. I present to you Ruth Mitchell, Bachelor of Arts Honours of this university. I present to you Tria Sanson Fisher, Bachelor of Arts Honours of this university. <laughs> Chancellor, I present to you a graduate of the degree of Master of Science. I present to you Larissa Gamage, Bachelor of Science Honours of this university. Chancellor, the degree of Doctor of Philosophy is awarded to a graduate who has successfully completed a prescribed program of study, principally of research. A thesis embodying the outcomes of the research is the principal basis of examination. The degree is only awarded if the thesis makes a significant and original contribution to knowledge and understanding of the field of knowledge with which it is concerned. Today, the university is proud to honour Doctor of Philosophy graduates who have satisfied these rigorous criteria for the award of the degree. Chancellor, I present to you Edda, Edda Semioni, Bachelor of Arts at Macquarie University and Master of Public Health at the University of Sydney. Dr Semioni's thesis is entitled Infertility in the Age of New Reproductive Technologies, Interpretations of Meaning About Children and Family. Chancellor, 
I present to you Krishna Chalowski, Master of Educational Studies of this university. Dr. Chalowski's thesis is entitled Prior Knowledge and Diagnostic Reasoning Processes in Clinical Problems Problem Solving by Experienced and Student Nurses. Chancellor, I present to you Kristen Bremel, Bachelor of Science of this university and Bachelor of Science with Honours of the University of Sydney. Dr. Bremel's thesis is entitled Surfactants and Polyelectrolytes, Interaction Forces, Stability and Flotation. Chancellor, I present to you Sophie Jones, Bachelor of Engineering of the École Nationale Supérieure des Génieurs de Génie Chimique. Dr. Jones' thesis is entitled The Physics of Bubble Formation and Growth in Solutions Super, super Saturated with Carbon Dioxide. Chancellor, I present to you Sir Li Guan, Bachelor of Science of Sejong Railway Institute. Dr. Guan's thesis is entitled Structural Reliability Estimation Using Finite Elements. Chancellor, I present to you Oliver Diesel, Bachelor of Engineering and Bachelor of Mathematics at this university. Dr. Diesel's thesis is entitled On Scheduling Dynamical FPGA Reconfigurations, a Partial Rearrangement Approach. Chancellor, I present to you Patrick Garvin, Bachelor of Science at the University of Sydney. Dr. Garvin's thesis is entitled Low Genus Drawings of Graphs in Three Dimensions. Chancellor, I present to you Lisa Lintz, Bachelor of Science at McGill University and Bachelor of Science with honours of this university. Dr Lintz's thesis is entitled Intercellular Rearrangement and Integrin Mediated Apoptosis. Chancellor, I present to you Jason Hughes, Bachelor of Science of this university. Dr Hughes' thesis is entitled The Electronic Structure and Row Vibational States of Helide Cations.
Chancellor, I present to you Kirsten Malloy, Bachelor of Science Honours of this university. Dr Malloy's thesis is entitled Applications of Model Fitting, Variable Temperature and Concentration Kinetics and Time-Resolved Luminescence Detection in Chromatography. Chancellor, I present to you Annette Nolan, Bachelor of Science Honours of this University. Dr Nolan's thesis is entitled The Chemistry of Heteropolylibdates and Heteropolytungstates of the Groups 7 and 9 Transition Elements. Chancellor, I present to you Jonathan Cress, Bachelor of Science of the University of Adelaide. Dr Cress's the thesis is entitled Generalised Conformal Killing Yano Tensors with Applications to Electrodynamics. Chancellor, I present to you Patricia Ostwald, Bachelor of Science Honours and Master of Science of this University. Dr Ostwald's thesis is entitled to determination of dose distribution of therapeutic electrons at interfaces. And Chancellor, you might note that in this, uh, in this afternoon's ceremony we will also award a, doctor, a PhD to Dr Ostwald's brother. Chancellor, I present to you Shugang Wang, Master of Arts of Sichuan University. Dr Wang's thesis is entitled STD and Age-Related Risk-Taking Sexual Behaviour Within the Dual Employment System of Sichuan, China. Chancellor, that concludes the presentation of research, research high degree candidates. I now call on the Vice Chancellor to present a candidate for an honorary degree. Chancellor. I have pleasure in presenting to you Dr William James Albert Jonas, Member of the Order of Australia, for admission to the degree of Doctor of the University. Chancellor, Dr Bill Jonas was born and grew up in the tiny town of Alworth on the banks of the Karua River just north of Newcastle. Alworth was too small to have a school, so Bill Jonas travelled an hour to Raymond Terrace each day for classes. When he outgrew this school, he and another student went on to teach themselves for their final two years of schooling. This other student was Mick Palmer, who subsequently became Federal Police Commissioner. Bill Jonas was mainly brought up by his uncle, an Aboriginal man who taught Bill to know and love the land on the banks of the Karua River and the town that now barely exists. It was the love of the land that influenced his career decision to become a geographer. Bill Jonas wanted to be a school teacher and after applying for a scholarship to Teachers College found he had in fact won a scholarship to the university. In 1963, he was awarded a Bachelor of Arts with Honours from Newcastle, which was then a university college of the University of New South Wales. His honours thesis was entitled The Karua River Valley, a study of interrelationships within a drainage basin. While at university, he lived with an aunt in Dudley and travelled in, in daily by double-decker bus. For a while, he taught in schools at Maitland and then applied for a postgraduate scholarship, which he won. 
In 1970, he was awarded his Master of Arts from this university for a study of dairy farming in the Avon and Gloucester River valleys. Bill Jonas did not receive that master's degree in person. He had already left to take up a teaching position at the University of Papua New Guinea where he enrolled in a Doctor of Philosophy program. With his doctorate on the timber industry of Papua New Guinea completed, Bill took up a lecturing position back here at Newcastle. So he missed the graduation ceremony for his Doctor of Philosophy degree as well. At this university, Bill Jonas was a lecturer and senior lecturer in the Department of Geography and is fondly remembered as an inspiring and enthusiastic teacher. In the late 1980s, he taught what was probably the first university subject in Aboriginal geography, taking field trips up the Manning and to the rapidly changing Karua River. His research interests and the basic needs of Aboriginal people in New South Wales resulted in the publication of a report with Mary Hall titled, Almost Out of Sight, Almost Out of Mind. This work and his work as a member and director of the Awabakal Cooperative brought him to the attention of a number of influential people. <coughs> Bill Jonas was asked to sit on the Royal Commission into British nuclear tests in, uh, in Australia called the Maralinga Commission. From the mid-1980s, he was increasingly involved in the Aboriginal culture and heritage. He was chairperson of the Joint Ministerial Task Force on Aboriginal Heritage and Culture in New South Wales member of the Immigration Review Tribunal and Commissioner of the Australian Heritage Commission. Increasingly, Bill Jonas found he had one foot in academia and the other in Aboriginal affairs at state and national level. In 1990, he accepted the position of Director, Aboriginal Education of this university and after only one year, he became the principal of the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, holding that office from 1991 until 1996. In 1996, he took on the position of director of the National Museum of Australia. Colleagues in Newcastle remember Bill as a free spirit and an intellectual who is deeply committed to Aboriginal rights. Through the National Museum of Australia, Bill is committed not to building a collection, but to tell the stories of Aboriginal culture and social history. In a recent radio interview, he affirmed his deep commitment to the process of reconciliation in Australia. Dr Bill Jonas is an example to all Australians of determination, effort and commitment. He has come from a one-room schoolroom on the banks of the Karua to head up the National Museum of Australia. Finally, he has arrived at a degree ceremony at the University of Newcastle that he is able to attend. <laughs> Chancellor, it is with great pleasure that I present to you Dr William James Albert Jonas, Member of the Order of Australia in the General Division, Bachelor of Arts with Honours and a Diploma in Education of the University of New South Wales, Master of Arts of the University of Newcastle and Doctor of Philosophy of the University of Papua New Guinea for the award of the degree of Doctor of the University. By the authority delegated in me by the Council, I hereby admit Dr William James Albert Jonas, Member of the Order of Australia, to the degree of Doctor of the University. We will now have a musical interlude presented by the Faculty of Music String Quartet. They will play a serenade by Haydn.
Thank you very much. Well, Dr. Jonas, not only do you have an opportunity to attend your own graduation ceremony today, but you have an audience waiting for you. Waiting for you. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome Dr. Jonas, who will deliver an address. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and most importantly, graduates. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Awabakal people, the traditional owners of the land on which this ceremony is held today. Chancellor, I thank the University of Newcastle most sincerely for the great honour which you've bestowed on me today. I believe that this is the third honorary doctorate to be awarded to an Aboriginal person by this university, and that makes me very proud. Very proud to be receiving the honour, but also proud to be associated with this institution, which, in the area of Aboriginal education and social justice, has for so long been an outstanding leader. As some of you know, I've had a long association with Newcastle University, and in fact I began my undergraduate studies back in 1959 at the old Newcastle University College in Tyres Hill. Most of my adult life, in one way or another, has been connected with universities, and I have the greatest respect for their work and for their traditions. However, I'm now part of another great tradition of knowledge and learning, in that I'm director of a museum, and it's about that which I want to talk today. In particular, I speak of a museum which is being built for all Australians, and that is the National Museum of Australia, which is due to open in Canberra in 2001 as the flagship for the centenary of Federation celebrations. More than $150 million has been allocated for the new museum in the Federation Fund, and a winning design for a building has already been chosen from an international design competition. As the flagship for the centenary of Federation celebrations, the museum is scheduled to open early in 2001, so we're very busy planning and working out exactly what it is we want to do and how we are going to do it. As part of our planning deliberations and also guiding them, the National Museum has this as its vision statement. Exploring the past, illuminating the present, imagining the future. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. But let me say for now that we bring together the past, the present and the future through three what we can call mega themes. And these are social history of the last couple of hundred years, indigenous cultures and people's relationships with the environment. And it's my belief that as we present the Australian experience to Australians and to the rest of the world, much of the most satisfying work that we do will be based around an integration of these themes, not by treating them separately. After all, much of the true story of Australia is the result of the interrelationships of black and white and the land. And we're achieving this integration by focusing on three smaller integrating themes, which are land, people and nation. Now, at this stage, I'd like to point out a fundamental difference between our museum, that is, your National Museum, and museums of the past. Previously, museums existed to display their collections of objects. And this was particularly the case with those national museums which brought the world to their people through their collections. You'll all be familiar with those museums which displayed glass cases full of the different members of the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom or geological specimens, usually in some classificatory or taxonomic fashion, possibly supplemented with dioramas showing the exotic other, such as the Eskimos or the Pygmies of Africa or an Aboriginal man standing on one leg holding a spear. Well, the National Museum of Australia will be telling the story of the Australian experience, and so we'll be taking Australia to the world. We'll use our collections to tell those stories, and we'll enhance the storytelling with whatever modern technology and our imaginations will allow. We'll use the museum tradition of displaying material culture and of conducting the best research 
to present the multiple voices of our wonderfully diverse population. And what we're going to be is a forum for a debate and a forum for exploration of issues. And I'm particularly excited about this. We'll host debates within the museum, but we'll also have the facility to broadcast to the world and to integrate exhibitions, live action, and broadcast simultaneously. And let me give you an example of this, an example of one of the debates. There's an interesting and often quite bitter debate occurring in Australia right now about the concept of wilderness. The term wilderness has been imported into this country, mostly from North America and Europe, where it's been used to describe places which are, by and large, remote. As somebody in the United States described wilderness, these are the places where the hand of man has not yet set foot. When it's applied with this meaning in Australia, the term is very problematic because Aboriginal people have been all over this land, have known it intimately, have sung it and dreamed it, and it's been anything but remote. Proponents of wilderness and wilderness societies and wilderness preservation groups all acknowledge this long relationship between Aboriginal people and the land while clinging to and continuing to apply the wilderness terminology. Aboriginal people quite rightly argue that in Australia there is no wilderness. Well, our museum will not present, for example, an exhibition on so-called wilderness without acknowledging that this debate is occurring. We'll even make the debate the focus of an exhibition, with both sides being presented as objectively as possible, and with visitors and those outside the immediate museum at least getting an understanding of the entire picture. You see, the days of simply accepting the myth of wilderness, like the days of accepting the concept of terra nullius, have now gone. And it's up to museums, such as the National Museum, to be a forum where debate of issues and exposure of invalid assumptions can be held. We want to be, in effect, a safe place for dangerous ideas. And as I said before, integrating the past, the present and the future will help us to do this. So what I'd now like to do is place my congratulations to all of today's diplomats and graduates in that context, the context of past, present and future. And I want to say something to you, which I recently also said to another group of brand new graduates, and it's this. You will all be feeling very proud of yourselves today for gaining your hard-earned awards, and this is indeed as it should be. But I'd like to add, though, that all of us here today and beyond should also feel a special pride in the fact that you represent our past, you are indeed our present, and you will be our future. This ceremony here today in Newcastle is based on centuries of tradition. And this is the tradition of acknowledging excellence in scholarship and, in a way, the tradition of acknowledging that you have absorbed some of the centuries of knowledge which have grown from that scholarship. You are now linked to and part of a very proud past. You've shown that you're able to pursue truth through critical inquiry, and I believe this is one of the most wonderful talents which anybody can develop. The pursuit of truth through the application of our critical faculties based on developed knowledge is absolutely essential if we are to understand and be a part of that present in which we find ourselves. We don't live, we do not live in an easy world, especially as many of our traditions do seem to be under many forms of attack. Universities do not seem to be such happy places as they once were. Our cultural diversity, which has brought us so many benefits, faces challenges from the xenophobic, and the rate of change around us is so rapid. But what you've learned, and the discipline of learning itself, which you've shown yourselves to be so capable of, will assist you to deal with those challenges by recognising injustices where these occur, by seeking remedies for wrong, 
and by understanding that change is not only inevitable, but it can of course be change for a better world. That better world is of course a future world, and it's your future. You are now moving into a position where what the world is like tomorrow will be decided by your decisions of today. And nobody will be better equipped than you to make those decisions. I heard somebody say recently that we cannot embrace the future until we leave the past behind. I think I know what they're saying, but I don't think I go on with it completely. What I do believe is that we cannot fully understand where we are at now unless we know where we've come from. That is, we must understand something of our past to adequately understand our present, and without that understanding, we can't steer ourselves into a future that we and future generations deserve. And that's one of the reasons that I greatly respect institutions which deal with these issues, that is universities and modern museums. And it's one of the reasons why people like yourselves who successfully pass through and emerge from these institutions so thoroughly deserve the, the awards which you're receiving. So please accept my congratulations along with those awards and my very best wishes to you and to the University of Newcastle for a successful and exciting present and future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jonas, for that address. Your description of the National Museum of Australia presents an exciting view of the way an institution might look in the future. And I know everybody here wishes you well in your endeavours there to turn it into a muse museum of real excellence. Good luck. I now have pleasure in our inviting Ms. Fiona Couch to speak on behalf of the graduates. Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, members of the University Council and staff of the University, fellow graduates, ladies and gentlemen. At the end of last week, having accepted this wonderful honour of speaking on behalf of my fellow graduates, I was hit with a wave of pre-exam panic, a feeling I'm sure many of my fellow graduates are familiar with. Realising that there was no extension to be granted, no matter how legitimate or imaginative the excuse, I found myself possessed with an urge to say goodbye to sleep, check the supply of coffee, instant noodles and tiny teddies, a personal study favourite, and lock myself in my room for hours on end. This behaviour, that too the uninitiated observer may lead to a clinical diagnosis, is that of a student. And with a cry of, oh no, the student monster is back, my partner prepared to pack up our 20 month old daughter and evacuate the house with such precision the military would have been proud. It wasn't quite as dramatic as that. There were plenty of tiny teddies. But having regained my composure, and with promises to the family that the student monster had been contained, I began to reflect on the years that have led to today and contemplate the rich and diverse group of fellow graduates that I would be representing. As one would imagine, the graduates whom have received the testimonies today have all travelled their unique paths to reach this point. For some, this has taken a little bit longer than for others. Some came to the university straight from their high school certificates some as international students, others as graduates completing further studies, and some matriculated as mature age students through TAFE or Open Foundation, or as I did through the New Step program, a program unique to Newcastle University, offered to young people who have been disadvantaged in their education in some way, such as illness, as in my case. This program is but one of the many fine examples of the efforts of this respected and innovative university to make tertiary education accessible and attainable to all. Whether our chosen profession or path once at the university was in the arts, law, education, engineering, medicine, health sciences or science and mathematics, our time spent as students has equipped us with the ability to embrace change and challenges by exposing us to many different views and opinions and ways of approaching life. This occurred through, academic, through the academic curriculum but also through just participating in the cosmopolitan campus life. But whatever our individual experiences, today does represent the thousands of hours of work we have done. 
the lectures, tutorials, clinical and practical placements we've attended, the assignments we submitted, the presentations we have given, the examinations we have passed, and the hours we've spent in the car park searching for that elusive space, a true test of our time and stress management skills. But because of the efforts we've made, we all have every reason to be very proud of our achievements. And while today we have been rewarded for our academic achievements, each one of us is aware that we did not reach this point alone. There were many people who contributed to our success and should be sincerely thanked for their efforts. Our lecturers and tutors, who often against great odds encouraged, coerced and consoled us. They have endowed us with their valuable knowledge and equipped us with the tools of critical thought and analysis that can be applied universally and not just within each of our chosen professions. For this we are truly grateful. I would also like to thank the administrative, security, catering, cleaning, library and bar staff and all others that kept the university running, whose work we are often not even conscious of, but without them our university experience would not have happened. There are also the many individuals and organisations outside the university campus to which we must give great thanks for their contributions to our student lives and experiences. The hospitals, schools, legal centres and many other community-based organisations, the many supervisors who guided us in our acquisition of professional skills in, in these respective establishments, and most importantly, the patients, clients, children and many community members who shared a part of their lives so we could learn. We also acknowledge the support and contributions of our family and friends, many of whom are here today, because without them, we would not be here ourselves. <laughs> Thank you for kicking us when the procrastination bug had taken hold, for your words of encouragement and for making strong coffee at two in the morning, and for ensuring us that all was not lost and the world hadn't actually come to an end when the computer crashed and our assignment went to that elusive place where all great assignments go. <laughs> and most of all, thank you for listening. In conclusion, many of us will go our separate ways today. Some of us have already taken jobs, others will continue with further studies and their student monster behaviour. But the important contacts and friendships that have been formed from our time here at the university won't dissolve. As I've already found in my chosen profession of occupational therapy, my experiences here at Newcastle University are not in isolation, but have been a significant time where the grounds of my professional life have been established and are sure to see me, as with each of my fellow graduates and their chosen professions, through the years ahead as we continue on our paths of learning and reaching for our future goals. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Coach, for your speech. I now declare this ceremony concluded. May I invite all present to join us for refreshments which will be served in the University Union in the Brennan Room.
graduands exit.